Hello, welcome to this playlist, which is devoted to an understanding and an analysis of the Second Vatican Council. And in this playlist, we're going back to the early years of the church and working our way through history. The various videos on this playlist are numbered, so it might make more sense to you if you watch them in numerical order. Today we're talking about the Robert Council. The Second Council of Ephesus, later to be called the Robert Council, was held in the year 449. It's particularly noteworthy because it was intended to be an ecumenical council and was deemed as such. However, because of the nature of its proceedings and its decrees, it was rejected and nullified later by the Pope, Pope Leo. It was also later repudiated by the Council of Chalcedon two years later. The Robert Council was convoked by the Byzantine Emperor Theodosius II. It came just 18 years after the First Council of Ephesus, which had also been called for by Theodosius. I'm hopeful that you may recall that in our earlier installment on Arianism, we discussed that a council should never be called for just frivolous reasons. It's serious business. During an ecumenical council, the forces of light and darkness are in a pitched battle, and to call for a council unnecessarily only invites potential disaster. And as a matter of fact, the disaster is exactly what happened at the Robert Council. The council was attended by two legates of the Pope, Pope Leo I, and they were Deacon Hilarius, who later became Pope St. Hilarius, and a bishop named Julius. A third legate was also supposed to attend, but unfortunately he died along the way. Like the Council of Nicaea, the Robert Council dealt with the nature of Christ, though it correctly affirmed that Jesus Christ was both fully God and fully man, the council then wrongly decreed that there was only one united nature of, in Christ, and that was that of a divine human being. Now the president of the council was the patriarch of Alexandria, and his name was Dioscorus. The ambitious Dioscorus dominated the council and was very heavy-handed in directing it. The question before the council was whether the patriarch of Constantinople, Flavian, who was later named Saint Flavian, had unjustly excommunicated a priest who denied the two natures of Christ. The papal legates were supposed to read a letter pertaining to the matter from Pope Leo. However, Dioscorus suspected that it would be prejudicial towards Saint Flavian, so he didn't allow it. The letter, which survives to this day, did in fact support Saint Flavian, but it also supported readmitting the excommunicated priest if he would repent. The council was actually as much of a trial against St. Flavian as anything else. This is because Dioscorus saw St. Flavian as a rival. St. Flavian was never even given an opportunity to defend himself before the council. With the encouragement of Dioscorus, the sentiment of the council just steadily grew against St. Flavian. Dioscorus struck St. Flavian in the presence of all and St. Flavian was apparently severely beaten at the council itself. The secretaries of the bishops were prevented from taking notes under the threat of violence. Ultimately, the council voted to depose St. Flavian, and many bishops signed the decree out of fear of being beaten themselves. Some did not sign, but their names were added to the decree later. After deposing St. Flavian, the council had him tossed into prison. After being tossed into prison, St. Flavian died just three days later from the injuries he received as a result of the beating he had at the council. In the meantime, St. Hilarius declared, We oppose it! And he annulled the sentence in Leo's name. And he knew full well that his safety was in jeopardy if he stayed any longer, so he left with great difficulty. Dioscorus tried to block him from going to Rome or to Constantinople. After many trials, Hilarius returned to Rome and apologized to the Pope for not delivering his letter to the council. Meanwhile, back at the council, Patriarch Dominus of Antioch was an Orthodox bishop, and he was on friendly terms with Flavian, and he was also attending the Robert Council, and he sensed the danger that St. Hilarius had also felt. He therefore departed too, claiming that he was in poor health. Dioscorus then took this as an opportunity to have Dominus deposed. Fortunately for Domnus, he didn't meet any violence, and he went back to a monastic life, which he had never really wanted to leave in the first place. 
things weren't over yet. The Bishop of Jerusalem, who was loyal to Dioscorus, after having deposed the patriarchs of Antioch and Constantinople, stopped off at Nicaea on the way home, and with ten Egyptian bishops they declared that Pope Leo was excommunicated. After learning of all of this, Pope Leo declared that the council was a robber council. He deemed that henceforth the council would not be considered an ecumenical council. He excommunicated everyone who took part in it, and he absolved everyone who it had condemned. So what are the takeaways from this video? Well, first, as we discussed before, a council should only be called for serious doctrinal reasons. Angels and demons battle whenever there is a council, and there are almost always serious consequences following an ecumenical council. Following this council, the issue of the natures of Christ led to a schism that exists to this day. Churches, such as the Coptic Church, still defend Dioscorus, and even have made him a saint. These churches are not in communion with either the Catholic or the Orthodox churches. The second takeaway is that a pope can nullify an ecumenical council. The second council of Ephesus, the robber council, was deemed to be an ecumenical council up until Pope Leo declared that it was not. Everything that came out of that council was also nullified. So if a pope nullifies an ecumenical council, he can nullify everything that springs forth from it. And the third takeaway is that an ecumenical council can err. There is a belief that has not been formally defined as a heresy, and it's called conciliarism. The dissident theologian Hans Kung is a modern example of an individual that subscribes to this belief. Conciliarism holds that supreme authority in the church resides with an ecumenical council, apart from or even against the pope. In answer to this, it seems that the mere existence of the robber council disproves this theory, and we'll talk more about conciliarism in a future installment. Well, I hope you enjoyed this installment, and we'll be back again soon with another one. In the meantime, please pray for the church. Oh,